You may well wonder why in the world I'm standing here in front of a cottage in the cottage country of central Ontario, 50 miles or so northeast of Toronto. It's the home of Lewis Parker, whose forebears came from the Sydney area of Cape Breton, so there is that connection at least with our East Coast heritage. Lou Parker is a painter, and he produces magnificently detailed instants of history, recreations of times out of our past, the kind of thing that you'll be able to see this year at places like Fort Beausjour. It's a fascinating occupation, and it's gone, it's undertaken in a fascinating way. I think you'll enjoy this meeting with Lewis Parker. I first started to look into this story for heritage, there was one word that popped into my mind, which certainly doesn't express it all, but I think gives us a good place to start. The word was collaboration, which seems somehow foreign to the artistic temperament, but perhaps we can find out how it works. And that's why I'm glad that we have Terry Shaw here, who is an interpretation specialist with Parks Canada, because the two of you have worked so closely together on this series of paintings, but also I think Terry, long before this series ever came up? Uh, that, that's correct, and before I was with Parks Canada. Uh, goes back, I guess, to 1972, when uh, I was involved in the uh, uh, restoration, renovation of the National Museum build, building in downtown Ottawa. And uh, this was the National Museum of Man and the National Museum of Natural Sciences. And in that uh, one particular hall, the archaeology hall, um, we, of course, showed a lot of artifacts that, that archaeologists uh, dig up in their excavations. But to try and show the, the, the visitor what kind of story lay behind the artifacts, the activity that was carried on that related to those artifacts... These chunks and odds and bits right. wouldn't necessarily mean anything to That's people. right. Bones and uh, arrowheads and that sort of thing. Um, to try and bring that, the activity that left those in the ground, to bring that alive, uh, we decided to do some short films to recreate events. And uh, to do these films, we, we went to, to Lou Parker and his, uh, his partner, Jerry Lazar, to create artwork that we could then turn into, into these short films. And had you done this kind of work before? Yes, I'd been involved with uh, studies on Indians themselves, uh, mostly woodland. And this was quite a challenge after doing the Woodland Indians and the Plains Indians and the Mexican Indians to do the Indians of the North. Mm. Yes. This was this work was then was really done for films. That's although correct. these illustrations that we see here, of course, are in the book, but uh, yeah. these were actually used in the films. The original uh, purpose of the paintings uh, was was for these films uh, for the National Museum. That's correct. Now, how did you stumble on Mr. Parker? Well, we heard about the, the Indian paintings uh, the, the, that were used at St. Marie among the Hurons um, and uh, couldn't find anybody better qualified to, to do this kind of work with that kind of background. So how long did you work with him at that time, Terry? Oh, I guess the, it must have taken about probably better than a year, I'd say a year and a half, including the, uh, the pre-production time. And the archaeologists were involved in this too, were they, in the research for the backgrounds for these? That's right. Uh, I was essentially a, a middleman in that process, uh, an organizer, to bring the uh, necessary people together to provide the research, um, ensure that the, the uh, painting was historically accurate, um, to advise on the interpretation, and to uh, help create the complete sequence of events that would have gone into the, in this case, the whale hunt. Is there any measure of absolutism in accuracy? Uh, the ar archaeologists, can they offer definite facts or is it opinion which governs what goes in? Oh, it's, it's a decided mixture of the two. Uh, there are a lot of facts, but there, there's a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of areas that are, are, are speculative 
and um, it's a lot of areas that it's very hard to pin these experts down on and uh, uh, this is quite a game, in fact, between Lou and myself, because we have to have an answer. We we can't we can't avoid answering questions when we we show them in a painting. So it's it's great fun to try and pin some of the uh, the experts down on these points. Lou, had you ever done any work for film before? Not in the sense that the camera roamed around the painting, no. Uh, but the paintings of Indians done for Fort St. Marie at Midland were slides. Uh, they were still pictures taken of various taken of various areas of the uh, paintings, so it was very similar. And yet, it must have seemed like another new challenge for you oh, at the indeed. time. Oh, indeed! Oh, indeed! And uh, to have someone like Terry in the middle, as he said, organizing all these other people, rather than having to chase down as Jerry Lazar and I did for the uh, for the Woodland Indians having to read through the Jesuit relations and uh, Champlain and Sagar just took us away from the drawing board. Mm. Uh, Terry, in effect, prepares everything, all the material, and says, okay, this is what has to go into the illustration. And I consider them to be illustrations of historic life rather than paintings. A painting is where you're involved with color, form, light, but these are very subjective. You're involved with depicting people who existed three, four, five hundred years ago. And with as much accuracy as you can employ. Uh, and this is the whole point. The accuracy is much more essential than the painting. The, the paintings that we have here, this is the method of beluga whaling. Are these all of the frames that were done? for the film? That's right, yeah. Just the five. And just to, to arrive at that number, well, there's budgetary considerations. We, we had a budget to work to, but we had to decide how many pictures were needed to, to show the whole process, from sighting whales to uh, breaking the whales down into the food and the indu industrial fodder that uh, the Eskimos made of it. It seems amazing to me that you can get a 10 or 12 minute film out of five small frames, but they're not so small, and I guess the camera can get in quite close and work on them. Oh, the originals to these were what, Terry, about uh, 30 by 20 or something? Yeah, like I would that. say, yeah, at least that. Yeah. At least that that's and so nice. the camera could zoom in on one little section, say, pick out a character that, that had been concentrated on, and then follow out to the uh, background in which the whales in the next painting are indicated. Mm -hmm. Then so that you could travel naturally from one right. frame. And that also was a consideration that I guess you had to keep in mind. Yes, the, the time element in, in trying to get uh, a painting to show one instant in time, but to suggest what's gone before and what's going to come after. This, this is something that has to be figured out very accurately, too. I'm glad you said it in quite that way, because it gives us a perfect introduction to the series of paintings that we want to discuss right now. And that is the series that you have produced for Fort Beausjour. Yeah, I think you've explained the collaboration, that word that I used at the beginning, very well. And now let's see how it works. You have seven paintings. That's correct. Yeah. To illustrate the life, instants in time, in history, at Fort Beausjour. How, did it, how does that begin? Well, at Fort Beausjour, we have a very uh, special case of a historic site. Um, perhaps I shouldn't say special case because uh, it's, uh, there are a lot of sites uh, that are like this in that they're not suitable for, uh, for rebuilding structures or for putting people on site in costume. Um, various reasons for this. At, at Fort Beausjour, of course, the, the, the ruins that are there <coughs> represent quite a, a, a wide span of time. Uh, some of them are from the French period, some of them are from the British period of, of the fort. And it would be a very difficult decision to make uh, what period you would, would build uh, structures if you wanted to restore uh, the, the fort. Or there may have been different structures on the same site at different periods. That's right, periods, yeah. exactly. Now, in the case of Lewisburg, is I think, a, a useful parallel where they have restored the site to a particular point in time. And they, they do put animators, people in costume, on that site to attempt to bring the site alive, to, to recreate a moment in time. But that's a very expensive 
uh, route to take, and as I say, not all sites are, are, are suited to that. Um, at Fort Beausjour, we've adopted the use of paintings, in effect, to do much the same thing, to try and uh, create um, a, a reconstruction uh, of a, a, an event of, of the site itself in terms of structures, show the people uh, that would have been there at that particular time in costume, um, and often uh, a particular event of, of significance in the history of the fort. Um, so we kind of bring it all together in a painting. And I think this is, uh, from an interpreter's point of view, uh, a very effective technique in trying to stimulate the imagination of the visitor to the site, try and get them to think and imagine what it was like to be on that site back in, in a point in history. I have a mental impression of an army of people all concentrating their energies on the development of, say, one idea for one of these paintings. Is that reasonably correct? That's not far off the mark. It's sort uh, of funneled, though, rather than uh, <laughs> everybody doing it in one, at one time. It's all funnels through Terry. So. Mm -hmm. Essentially, the... <laughs> You're the neck in the bottle, are you? That's right. <laughs> uh, essentially, the, the concept originates with the interpreter. Uh, the, he decides on uh, that we're going to use this particular medium to uh, uh, achieve our, our interpretive goals, and then uh, determines the, the concept of behind the painting, the selection of the particular point in time, uh, of the event to be shown, that sort of thing. That, those decisions are made by the interpreter. Well, why don't we get to one of the paintings, and, and you can go through the whole process okay. for us, the two of you, and we'll find out just where it started, how it developed, what stages you went through, and what the finished result is. Okay, well, let's, let's take, uh, take this, this painting which shows Fort Beausjour in, uh, in 1754, which is the, in the French period, uh, one year before the, the fort was uh, taken over by the, the British forces. And this is an interesting one, because uh, it, it, I think, illustrates the kinds of things that I, I was, was mentioning in that it involves the, the reconstruction of, of structures. It involves a considerable amount of animation by people uh, in the period dress of the time, um, and it also illustrates certain historic themes that uh, are important to, in the history of Fort Beaux. Well, how many of those buildings are present on the site now? Oh, none. However, there are all that's left on the site now. Essentially, are some some old foundations that have been stabilized. Um, there are no buildings as such. You have a photograph. That that's you right. were just reaching for it, Luke. Mm -hmm. Well, this. This shows the same view uh, that a visitor to the site would see if they were standing in this the spot represented by the painting today. They would they would see this, and as you can see, it's very different. There there are no structures there. There are some stone foundations. These existing structures are not, were not necessarily there. These these stone structures were not necessarily there at the time that we're showing in 1754. For example, the stone wall, the curtain wall in the background, that was not there uh, in the French period. That was a later addition to the fort. Um, and actually, the stone foundations that you see in the foreground also are from the British period. So I can see quite clearly why you need the painting to depict That's right, exactly. what was there then. That's right. And when we go about recreating this, we, we have to... Uh, uh, as I say, once the concept is, is determined and the point of view and the intention of the painting, that's when we bring in all these, literally an army of people, to provide all the precise information, the research, so that we can, can uh, create as accurate a representation as possible of what it was like in 1754. Lou, when Terry comes up with one of these ideas, what inf what's the first information that you get? Well. Let me see. The, the generally, the first, sh the first thing I had to concentrate on was the shape of the fort, which remained fairly constant from 1754 until the last one shot, 1779. Mm -hmm. So that allowed me to select perspective points to viewpoints uh, based on the plans that we had developed. Is it is the one with the plans there? Yeah, down at the bottom. There. 
this is a plan of the fort uh, in 1752, uh, done by, a, I guess, a French engineer uh, at the time. And uh, so we can use this as our starting point, essentially. It, it shows the buildings that were on the site at the time. As Lou mentioned, the shape of the fort, the earthworks, are essentially the same as they were then. Um, so we are able then, once we've selected our, our point of view for the painting, we're able then to to determine just what buildings would be in the, in, the, uh, in the painting. And then we have to look back and find out what those buildings would have looked like. We know where they, where they were situated, but what did they in fact look like? Did you have floor plans or architect's renderings or something to, to work to? You know, in this case, we, had, we had, did have one reference, uh, historic reference, of one of the buildings. And uh, that's one of the reasons we chose this angle, because we did have uh, a pretty good idea of what one of the major buildings looked like. That's the, the main building in the background. The other two buildings, no. We have no specific reference for them. Um, all we have is this original plan that, that says, for example, that the building on the right is a storehouse. That's all we know. Uh, we know that the building in the back was a, was a barracks. And again, that's basically all we know. So then your researchers would have to decide what a storehouse of that period would have looked like. That's correct. And where we're at a tremendous advantage in this, of course, is thanks to all the research that's been done at Lewisburg, where they have uh, recreated, rebuilt, uh, approximately one-fifth of, of that uh, 18th century city. And to do that, they have spent many, many years in, in very intensive research into historical structures of that period, uh, methods of building, um, and all this has been very helpful in giving us some kind of a clue as to what the structure uh, in Fort Beauchesure might have been like. Well, this is very close to the same period, that's, isn't it? That's correct. Mm -hmm. That's correct. For example, um, in this, this particular storehouse, um, we went around and talked to our, our uh, our, our research people, and uh, there was no clear-cut answer, but the consensus was that the building would be a PK-style building. Um, actually, this, this changed throughout the evolution of this painting. It started out as a, a plank building, and um, then we later changed it to this PK-style, which is the, the upright uh, logs with, with plaster in between, hmm. because it was felt that this more primitive style of building is, is probably all that would have been done at this time when building uh, just a simple storehouse. So somewhere along the line, you have to make, well, not compromises exactly, but decisions as to what would have been done. They might not necessarily be correct, but they'll be close. That's right. And th this is, uh, as I say, where we try and pin our experts to the wall, <laughs> whether they like it or not. But and experts don't like being they pinned. Often do they don't. <laughs> in, in determining, uh, for instance, that building, on the right that we're referring to there. What happened to it? Yeah, they're determining this building, even the sketches, the preliminary sketches, went historically through uh, all kinds of uh, styles of architecture in which the experts or the authority of researchers would have to say, that's out, that's out. And, and for each one of these, you did one of these linear drawings, is that right? Uh, well, not the whole thing. Boy, that, that would take... Uh, to, to redraw the whole thing over and over again. No, we'd, we'd do sections of it. Uh, and, well, as a matter of fact, I would, I would do the sketch and send Terry maybe five, six different Xeroxes, and he would send these to uh, the authorities who would, who would really have to be faced with uh, a, a two-dimensional presentation of what it might have looked like, so, so they could say, just change that a little bit. See, we had this problem, especially on this one with the windows, with the shutters. It, it went back and forth from casement to uh, to uh, what's the other style? Well, the sash, sash. Uh, style, right? And then the shutters, whether they were single shutters or double, and uh, even to the final painting, we would make decisions that would. Uh, just change it slightly if, if some authority, some new authority or some consideration we hadn't uh, had before came in, into play. We'll take a long and detailed look at the other paintings Lewis Parker has done for Fort Beausejour right after these messages.
Each painting represents a precise moment, a detailed record of an historical event. This is Fort Cumberland, the British name, in November 1776. The garrison has been alerted to a threat of attack by a group of American revolutionaries under Jonathan Eddy. We see British soldiers moving barrels of gunpowder from storage outside to a strong casemate. Several buildings, a danger to the fort if set on fire, are being dismantled. A few months earlier, in the summer of 1776, Fort Cumberland is reoccupied by the British after being abandoned since 1768. A group of Yorkshire settlers who have taken over the rich marshland since the French left are helping the new British garrison to set the decaying fortifications to rights. These are the Royal Fensible Americans under Joseph Gorham, sent here to protect the frontier and the back door to Halifax from any revolutionary incursions from New England. They will not have very long to wait. Summer, 1778. Two years have passed. Two years too many for much of the garrison. Gorham's royal fencibles have seen no action since Eddie's abortive uprising in late 76. Two soldiers, relieved from guard duty, hurry to the inviting warmth of the barrack block fires. Soldiers of the Compagnie Franche de la Marine remove supplies from a casemate. It is 1754. Fort Beausséjour is still French. In the background, Thomas Pichon, civilian administrator of the garrison and British spy, checks his stock. He will be instrumental in the fort's fall to the British, as it did shortly before this picture. Now it is spring, 1756. We see soldiers of the 40th Regiment returning home after a day on woodcutting detail. There are still many French partisans as well as hostile Indians, so outside work means an armed escort. Another year has passed. It is now 1757, and the defenses of Fort Cumberland are still being strengthened. The old French main gate has been removed, and a strong casemate put in its place. The British felt the old gate invited attack from the landward side, and have moved it to a more defensible position. In another year, Louisbourg will fall, and in 1759, Quebec. The Seven Years' War will be over, but that time is not yet. In the background, a Royal Artillery officer supervises the installation of a gun battery on top of the new casemate by soldiers of the 43rd, while soldiers of the 28th Regiment have their hands full with this gun, a naval piece weighing nearly a ton. Very quickly, how long does it take from the time you get the first suggestion from Terry until you have the completed painting? Well, gee, uh, <laughs> it, it, it depends on how fast the reference comes to Terry, uh, Terry and he can get it back to me. Uh, <clears throat> we could render one of these things if everything went like clockwork, which is <laughs> inconsiderable. It never does. But it, if it did, it would be, say, uh, a week establishing the viewpoint and the, and the pencil and even everything. An, another week establishing uh, all the details that have to go into the characters uh, that, that are portrayed doing things. Another week to get it all consolidated and then a final week to color it. And then another week, another half a week to make the corrections on, uh, on the new authorities that turn up. Okay, now that's a month, but it yeah. doesn't happen in a month. No, in practice it takes several months. Uh, and, and I must say that uh, Lou, besides being a fabulous artist, is the, probably the most patient man I've ever met. <laughs> uh, there are corrections coming in right up to the last minute, and uh, Lou has been extremely patient in uh, and uh, you know making these corrections as they come in, even up to making corrections on the final painting, uh, virtually as it's being delivered. Well, there's another program <coughs> following hard on our heels, and I don't think it has much patience. Thank you very much. Lewis Parker has now been commissioned to do an eighth painting for the Fort Beausséjour collection. In the meantime, he has been busy with other projects for the area. Next week, we'll discuss this painting with Lewis Parker, the building of the dikes at Grand Pré by Acadian settlers in the 17th century. A painting like this is not a painting in itself. It's a work animal to, to illustrate, to describe something, to do something, to do a task, to tell people now what it was like 300 years ago. And so it's not a, a painting as is, it's, a, it's an illustration.
So I haven't played back November 7. I still hope to get one. When the Acadians settled along the shores of the Bay of Fundy in the 17th century, all the way from what we still call the French shore up to the end of Cobequid Bay, they quickly realized they had chosen a hostile environment. Impenetrable woods crowded the shore to the water's edge, almost impossible to clear successfully with their primitive tools. Tides 40 to 50 feet high rolled up the bay and back again twice a day, leaving miles of mud flats at low tide, a waste of water at peak. But these people had dealt with such conditions before. In their part of France, it was customary to dike the shorelands, reclaim the land from the sea, and grow immense crops on the rich alluvial soil they had quite literally created. They used their skills here. And even today, the results of their labor more than 300 years ago are still apparent. The early Acadian dikes have been superseded by more modern structures, but the principles remain the same. To give some idea of how the Acadians tamed the Fundy tides, Parks Canada commissioned artist Lewis Parker to recreate the 17th century scene. Terry Shaw was the Parks Canada interpretation officer who worked with Lewis Parker. Well, it was one thing to decide that the scene must be shown, but how to go about it? The dikes the Acadians built either no longer exist or they lie buried under new dikes, many of them rebuilt in this 20th century still holding back the waters of the Fundy so that the land can be used. Written records from Acadian times are rare. They disappeared with the dispersal of the Acadians in 1755. I asked Terry where they got the information they needed to do the illustration. Well, I think this is a rather interesting painting because there is nothing in existence that, that we know of that attempts to show this process, show this activity. Uh, carried on by the Acadians uh, while they were in Nova Scotia, settled around the Bay of Fundy area. So we're really, uh, and there's very, very little in the way of historical information on it. There are very few records that survive from the Acadian period. And yeah, I would suspect very little left of the original dikes. Very little left. Uh, I think there may be some, some remnants left, but that's, even that's open to debate. Uh, because all of the land, uh, or much of the land that was originally reclaimed is still being used. And the old dikes have been, in most cases, superseded by, by uh, more recent dikes. So how did you find out how these abattoirs, or ab abattoir, is it? Abattoir, that's, that's correct. The abattoir is the, is the sluice way to distinguish that from the dike itself. Uh, the purpose of the abattoir is to allow, once the dike is in position, to allow drainage to occur from the, the, the land that was formerly flooded uh, by the tide. But when the tide comes up, the abattoir has a valve, a one-way valve, which will close and prevent the seawater from coming back in onto the old marshland. So it was really the key to the successful dike. That's correct, it was. Now, you work with Lou very closely in order to get these details right. Can you go through the process a little bit? Okay, in this case, uh, as I mentioned, there's very little um, academic information uh, available in, in, the, uh, in, in the historical literature on this process. There are a couple of eyewitness accounts, but they're very sketchy and they're very ambiguous in the, their interpretation. So, in this case, um, it wasn't enough to just go to the historians uh, to find out what was in the record. We went uh, to people who had practical experience in dike building uh, in this century. 
And we, we found, we went to three gentlemen that uh, have had a lot of experience, a lifetime of experience. Uh, all three of these gentlemen are now retired. And uh, we went and sought these people out, people who have worked in the, uh, in the building of dikes in this century, who have made a study of uh, dike practices, and who are as qualified as anybody to tell us the most likely way that the Acadians would have built their dikes. So that the same methods you think were used more recently uh, that the Acadians used back then? The, the same principles, certainly, uh, uh, are, are, have been used more recently. Um, the principle of the key itself in which they sank the, uh, the dike? Well, yeah. essentially, yeah, the, the essential principle of the, of the mud dike, uh, which is faced with, with sods that are specially cut to create a remarkably steep slope and, and still hold together over, over decades. Um, the, the sods are faced so that the marsh grass continues to grow on the outside and, and knit the whole thing together. And of course, the principle of the abato is still used today. If you go out to uh, the Grand Prairie Marsh, you'll, you'll see much larger abato now in use, uh, metal ones uh, that have been put in in this century. But the principle is exactly the same as the Acadians uh, practiced back in the 18th century. When we began, you were talking about the particular problem you face with the reflection of the water off the mud at different portions in the, of the dike uh, where the, the, uh, the mud would be wetter, for example, and where it might be drier. Are there any other problems? I suppose there are other problems that you face in this incredibly complex thing. Well, there's a problem of... of uh, I'll, I'll talk about the color in the day. Okay. The problem of the uh, trying to keep an overall balance. We've decided to keep the sun behind a cloud. That's why we've got uh, some cumulus clouds in the background, which will shade the, the whole area. Well, if we do that, there's actually, because of the blue of the sky coming through the clouds, there's actually more blue reflected uh, in the clay. We're, we're trying to determine, uh, well, right now I can't, I can't think of the figures or anything else. I, all I can think of is, is how we're going to, to, sh to show the re realities of the different levels, the different perspectives. There's, there's clay at this level, but the, the light that's reflected most is along the river bank and uh, down the, the face of this almost pyramid and that side there. And until I get that resolved, I really can't think of what we're going to do back here. Uh, there's just no, there's very little clay showing back there anyway. So you know, all the, 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 the clay that, that goes into the dike is, is dug up from the marsh itself. You can see up here although it's not finished, but they're, they're still spading here to dig up sods to put on the face of the dike. The, the main dike material is, is dug out from a trench here and, and brought in from other parts of the marsh. It's all wet mud, wet clay. And Lou's problem is to, is to get that, that sense of, of the wetness in the, mud, in, in the mud. It's a very dense mud. Um, has a very specific color coming from this particular marsh. And as he mentioned, it will change from down here where it's, it's glistening with water to up here where it's been dug up, piled in a, uh, in a big pile or put into the dike, and it will start to perhaps dry out somewhat, and all this will cause a, a difference in the appearance of, of the mud. So it's, it, it's quite a subtle problem. There are things in this picture which confuse me, I must admit. I had no idea, for example, that these dikes were made with what looked like green leaf twigs um, fitted around the abwato and, and up the slopes of the stream. Well, this is a mistake we made in the first linears. Uh, we developed the, the first linears without the knowledge that there was a substructure around the abato which would keep the dike from being washed away in the first tide. Mm -hmm. The, yeah, well, this, that would be a major mistake, I guess, if it had been left well, that way. Well, again, um, this is a case of where we have no specific historical in information on this point. Um, we, we, know, we knew generally that the abato was placed in this shallow stream bed where there's natural drainage. Um, and we know that there's a, basically a mud dam buildup and incorporated into the dike. Um, but it's only when you talk to people who've actually built dikes have actually installed abato in, in the, this kind of situation 
that you become aware of the practical problems involved. And in this case, as we were told, the, um, this mud is very slippery. There has to be some way of essentially locking this structure in position you so that it, it won't slide. You have to bind it in. That's, that's correct. Mm -hmm. And what they do, uh, as far as we know, to the best of our knowledge, the most likely way they would have done that is to put a, a brush mat made of uh, spruce trees uh, in the stream bed, uh, hold it down with, with branches and, and, and stake it very firmly into the mud to provide essentially friction, and then place the abato on top of that and start building your, your mud structure up from there. And this structure itself, the dam, the same principle applies that layers and layers of brush are interleaved as the dike, as the dam is built up to essentially knit the whole thing together. More about the problems of recreating one small piece of the 17th century right after these messages. May I suggest something here? Because what we're looking at now is the beginning of the color work on the final painting, but there are stages that you have gone through which will have settled some of these points long before you got to the business of laying color in. Could we go to some of those earlier stages and, and discuss those so that perhaps they can illustrate some more of the problems a little more clearly? Okay. This is the first of the linears well, the first of the finished linears that describe the uh, uh, layout of the land based on th that one original photograph. <laughs> Is it back here? Yeah. One photograph of the uh, site, the actual site that exists today, of course, without the, uh, the stream beds. So you began with a photograph. That's correct. Uh, we went out to the marsh and essentially picked the location that we figured was most appropriate for where the Achilles might have been building a, a dike and putting in an abato uh, back in the, in the 18th century. Mm -hmm. Of course, this is imaginary. We don't know that they actually did it in this spot, but it's a very likely position. Um, it's all cultivated fields now, but it gives us also a relationship of the, the village of Grand Pre on the upland, its relationship to the marsh. Um, Back in the 18th century, the, there was a sizable village of Grand Pre, and the houses were essentially organized along the upland adjacent to the marsh, uh, so they had easy access to the marshland where they, they grew their crops. You said the 18th century. Is that when they started building the dikes? Or well, actually, I they... I had the feeling it was even before that. That's correct. That's correct. Uh, uh, as far as we know, the, the diking practice uh, started probably in the uh, 1630s or 1640s. So we're really talking 17th century then. That's correct. Now, Grand Pre wouldn't have been at this stage of development until, until after the turn of the century, into the 18th century. All right, Terry, you had the photograph. And you must have come down here to Lou Parker's studio with some ideas of what you wanted him to do. That's correct. Well, he had already sent, this, this is Terry's piece of artwork. This, we, we started out with the Grand Pre and with the, uh, uh, some of the boats of your things where Terry sat down and figured uh, exactly that we needed, for instance, in Beau Year, we needed uh, seven paintings. So he, he gives me his concepts, which are quite quite descriptive, you know. All Terry, I, have to I, I, I must interject here. I think I prefer Lou's work. Uh, <laughs> so do I. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you see, everything's here. It's just uh, had to be refined more. If I didn't have this and the photograph to start with, then I, I would be making doodles and sketches and sending them to Terry, and he would be... Uh, going to the uh, authorities who would verify them gradually. But what Terry has already done is contacted the, the authorities, got a first impression. Yeah, you, you, you've done it. That's oh, yes. all the reference. Mm -hmm. Got a first impression and, sent, and said, Lou, this is, this is what I understand it to be. And I say, uh, well, we've got to get a little higher if we're going to show these guys working in the foreground, or uh, we've got to uh, show a little more distance from the horizon down to here so we can show the other side of the dike and show the men working as they are, as they are over this side. So I start making 
uh, little squibbles, which first for the, uh, the dike construction itself, and that was funny. Remember that day, Terry, where we had to decide what the slope was, th that the, uh, it had to be five feet high, but it had to slope that way, had to slope that way, and go six feet into the, uh, down to the riverbed, mm -hmm. come back up on this side. So we went through, oh, I don't know, eight or ten of these things just to establish the, the formation of the land as it must have looked before it was all filled in like that. It's quite a precise geometry, in other words, to this whole structure, and that's why it took us quite a while to work that out. Before we even thought about putting people into it, just to get the basic geometry established. And because these fields are still in use, you couldn't do the archaeological work with the excavations that might have turned up or the, the evidence of exactly how it was done. That's correct. Uh, there's, as far as I know, there's been no archaeological work done on uh, what are presumed to be old Acadian dikes, though I think there's been some, some inadvertent discoveries of some pieces of wood uh, from old Acadian dikes, but nothing systematic that I know of. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go on. Well, the next stage after establishing this is a confirmation. That wasn't it, by the way. When Terry came down the second was the last time, and we sat down trying to figure out it just wasn't right. And uh, can we put that up? Sure. Uh, yeah. Where we can see it. <clears throat> uh, what happened here just just wasn't right, and it had something to do with. Well, it had something to do with how far they would have got along before they filled in here because they knew the tide was coming in. Well, to fill in all that area from here to here, they couldn't have done, presumably, in, in the time. So we had to bring this over, slope it down to the riverbed, which gave us the angle continued up, which is what eventually led to, to this res resolution here. And yet that sketch is a very clear representation to me of how they put the sods on the sides of the dike and uh, and build up around the abattoir. Oh yes, that worked. We have, you know, uh, no sketch or scribble that we make is, is wasted because we, we've learned either negatively or positively towards the finished pa painting. Mm -hmm. uh, so... Let me just point out one, one change. Uh, th this illustrates rather well compared to the, the present painting. Um, let me just move that aside. Leave the, the, yeah. In the, in the original sketch, we had the, the face side built up on the face of the dam right from the bottom, right at uh, the bottom where the abattoir was placed. Um, and as one of our consultants pointed out later, uh, since in the, in the stream bed, in the natural condition, the, the marsh grass doesn't grow any further down than, say, halfway down the bank, it's asking a lot for sods to actually grow lower down where the, the ecology is not suitable. So um, that's a fairly obvious point and uh, we resolve that by adopting a different method of facing the dike in the lower portion. This is a brush facing and what they do is they pound stakes down into the mud and pack in brush behind that and there will probably be one more layer step back slightly above that. And once they get that filled up to a certain point then they can, the, the sod facing will take over. So that's the kind of change that uh, we make as we go along. Well, you become aware of the kind of complexity of detail that you must go into in order to get anything approaching accuracy. I must mention this, how, yeah. how helpful these were. One of the fellows that, uh, one of the, uh, the uh, fellows that's now retired and has worked all his life on, on dikes, um, Mr. Byers from Halifax, and uh, he's a, a terrific old gentleman, and he, he provided some initial sketches that were a big help to us in trying to visualize the, the process. Uh, this example here, he's indicating just how, how the sods were cut with a special diking spade. Uh, there's a very okay. precise technique involved here. And secondly, he's showing how these sods are, are uh, transported. Now, we didn't use the horse. We've, we've gone with the oxen. He's very good on swayback spavined horses. <laughs> he certainly is. <laughs> And, and th this sort of sketch was very helpful to us. Uh, there were details like, at, at first, we had resolved, no, we hadn't resolved, one oxen or two. Would they be pulling a wagon? What size wagon? Um, what kind of yoke? And uh, I don't know what, at what stage we, we eliminated the wagons because of the fact that they, the wheels would bog down on the mud before they got off the shore. But they, uh, I guess it was from this 
sketch here that, that we resolved that it should, right. it's got to be a, it had to be a sled, then could one oxen pull it? And we decided not through the mud. Mm -hmm. So if it was two oxen, then it had to be double yoked. Well, then how is it, uh, how are the... Uh, mm, the connection to the, to the sled To the itself. sled, how, how is that? We still don't really know that, so we're trying to hide it. <laughs> well, in, in some cases, we, we, you, hate, you hate having to hide things, but if there's absolutely no information, then you can't put that no information down. So, of course, we, uh, we build up this pile of spruces, which will... Uh, disguise exactly how the traces join onto the sled. What about costumes? This is usually an area where historical research pays off fairly easily because there are lots of records about it, but I'm not so sure about the Acadians with their homemade homespuns. Well, that's, that's true. The costumes are relatively simple, but we're very fortunate to have the assistance of the people up at Karaket, the Acadian Historic Village, uh, northern New Brunswick. The, They've done a lot of research on costume. They make their own costumes for their own animation program. In fact, they, they not only weave their own costumes, but they also dye them. They make their own dyes from, from local uh, plants and so on. So they have a lot of practical experience now in, in costume making, and they've been a great help to us on this painting. You've been talking to Shan Arsenal. That's right. <laughs> yes, she's a tremendous help. Yeah, we had uh, quite a problem in determining how the shirts necked and uh, they're really very simple, but I couldn't get that for, for the first number of sketches. I kept wanting to fold the collars down. Well, we sent a copy of the of the sketch up to Jean Arsenault, and she sent it back with very precise corrections on the sketch as to how the how the chemise, the shirt, uh, how the neck was was actually made. This is the village of Grand Pre in the background. That's right. And there are buildings in there. Do you have historical reference on those? Yes, we do. Uh, again, our major source is here would be Lewisburg, uh, is really our, our primary source for 18th century structural uh, information, architectural styles, and, and that sort of thing. Um, they have provided us with, with, with references on the, the standard type of construction of the period. Um, <clears throat> it's most likely that the PK style of building, once again, the, the use of vertical uh, vertical trunks, vertical uh, uh, pieces of wood with, with clay in between to, to finish off the wall. Very mm -hmm. simple method of architecture and very common. At and that is time. that a sod roof? That's a sod roof on, in this photograph. At, uh, this, this is from a building at Lewisburg. Um, but we're not showing sod roofs uh, at uh, uh, Grand Pre. Uh, again, our consultants felt that it would be more likely to have a plank roof in this case. Another style of, of construction, the, the uh, Charpon style, is shown in this sketch. Actually, this sketch shows both styles. It shows some piquet and it shows a uh, Charpon. And that's a fairly typical uh, building of the period. And, uh, with the enclosures at the back? That's the right. Back. With the, the fenced-in enclosures for, for livestock, uh, which is very, uh, and, and small gardens. Uh, in Grand Pre, they, they grew their wheat on the marsh, but most of their, their vegetables and their uh, that sort of uh, garden produce was grown adjacent to the farmhouses in fenced-in enclosures. Terry, this, uh, in the photograph that we saw earlier, I think this is it here, it's an open field. Is that, that's the point of view. Is this where the final painting is going to be set up? No. No, the final painting will be uh, on display at Grand Prairie National Historic Park, which is actually what you see in the background here. You see the present uh, church which is actually a museum uh, at, the, at the National Park. And as part of our interpretive display, we're going to put this painting uh, out on display overlooking the, the dike land um, and try and give a very brief uh, idea to the visitor of how the Acadians uh, diked the land and how they used it to produce their, their, the, the, the wheat that they grew in such quantity back in the 18th century. Well, this is a very much, at this stage, unfinished painting, and we have run out of time. Uh, while I thank you both very much for being with us, I'd like to just show one of Lou's earlier works, showing the expulsion of the Acadians, because it is finished. The one we see here is a print. And thank you both. It's been fascinating. <laughs>